In this tutorial, we'll talk about the dip pen, its advantages, its disadvantages, and why it's going to be a required material in this class. Then I'll show you a few different nib options, some which are required and on your materials list, and some, some which are recommended and you should definitely know about. After that, I'm going to show you how the dip pen is used and show you a few different exercises you can do to get yourself acclimated to this difficult but ultimately rewarding medium. So why use a dip pen, particularly when we have so many pen options at our disposal? I know that many of you are familiar with a wide array of markers and pens available, um, all of which are probably much easier to use than the dip pen. Uh, look, I use them too. Um, I have a bunch here, I've got a Micron, uh, artist pens, uh, they're really handy. Uh, they're portable, they're durable, they don't leak, the ink in them dries instantly, and the ink is really waterproof. The problem with them is that they do not provide a lot of line variation, meaning that if you press down on them, you might get a slightly thicker line, but mostly you risk breaking the delicate felt point. The lines they put down are mostly of a single thickness, and lines with single thickness lack expression. They're monotonous. They're somewhat, they're somewhat dry. Uh, this is where the dip nip really shines. The tines, let's see if you can see this, uh, the tines are the fork, the two little prongs on each side of the nib, uh, separate when you put pressure, which creates a thicker line. Now, some nibs are a little stiffer and easier to control. They're more for beginners. Uh, they're the ones you're going to be using mostly. Um, and then some nibs are so delicate and so flexible that even a little bit of pressure will make the line go from thin to super, super thick. No marker or modern pen matches the dip nib. It simply reigns supreme in that respect. Uh, the dip nib, dip nib also has the advantage that it can easily change, you can easily change ink colors when using it. So all I need to do is take the nib out, wash it, and then boom, I can change to a different color. And really the number of different colors you can get in these inks is endless, particularly once you start mixing them. Um, I can also make little tiny adjustments to the ink to make it flow better or to make it more transparent. Um, I can also put watercolor in my ink, which I'll show you how to do, not in my ink, excuse me, on the dip pen, which I'll show you how to do later. Um, this makes this material incredibly versatile, much more versatile than any one of the microns or the pigment liners that you may have used before. Now, to be fair, there are disadvantages too. Uh, the most important of which is that you're forced to constantly re-dip your nib in ink to keep drawing. Uh, this can be somewhat tiresome at first. Uh, you have to be careful how much ink is on it, otherwise it'll drip all over the place. And when you first start, that might be something that happens very, very often. Uh, these little balls can spill. Now you can buy or make a little ink stand for yourself that's a little more stable than, than this thing. Uh, but look, uh, once you get used to it, and you will, uh, these are relatively small problems, and I think you'll find yourself, with few exceptions, reaching for, for your dip pen when you're doing line work. Um, okay, so now let's talk about some of these nibs that I have and their respective properties. These two nibs are on your materials list. They're the Hunt Globe 512 and 513EF. These three are recommended and we're going to talk about them later. Let's start off with the 512. Let's put it in. And let's try using it. So, first of all, uh, when you're buying a dip nib, the first thing you need to do is clean off the varnish that is usually on it. The way to do that, and there's a number of different methods, uh, there's some artists that use a flame, like a cigarette lighter, I don't recommend that. Uh, the best way is to take a toothbrush with a little bit of toothpaste and scrub the nib a little bit, uh, rinse it off. Uh, that's going to clean off the varnish and allow the ink to adhere, to stick to the nib a little bit better. With the varnish on, you'll find that the ink just kind of pulls off and runs off very quickly. Uh, which gives you less time to work, less time to put down a line before re-dipping. Okay, so that's number one. Um, now, you'll also find that these nibs have a little bit of a lifespan, meaning that at the beginning, they are a little bit stiff. As you draw them, they open up, they become sort of optimally flexible, and then towards the end of its life, the pen will usually start to corrode a little bit, um, maybe the tines are going to be uneven, it's going to start feeling scratchy. You'll know when to throw out the nib. And again, these nibs are really inexpensive. Um, if you take care of them and dry them off, don't allow them to rust, um, you're going to get a lot of life out of them. But again, they're cheap, so it's really no big deal. 
Okay, so uh, we're dealing with the Hunt Globe EF. No, excuse me, the, the Hunt Globe 512. Um, whenever you dip your nib in the ink, make sure you're dipping past the reservoir a little bit, and then you want to give your nib a little shake to shake off any excess ink. This is really important. It has to become a habit. Every time you dip the pen, you need to give it a little shake on your paper towel. All right, uh, this will ensure that no ink will drip on your paper. Uh, because sometimes if there's excess ink, you start drying and then it bubbles up and then starts um, going all over your paper, which is obviously a tragic incident. Um, look, you're gonna make mistakes, um, especially at the beginning. Um, I'll show you a number of different ways to make corrections, so it's not really as big a deal as you think. Okay, so this is our Hunt Globe, Hunt Globe uh, 512. So this is considered an extra fine nib. It puts down a really nice line. Uh, this nib is sort of semi-flexible, meaning that in order to create a thicker line, I really have to put some pressure down on it. And it does create a thicker line. Um, now, you see how the stroke is starting to railroad a little bit? Uh, that means it's out of ink, so I need to re-dip it. Um, try to keep your ink on the same side as your paper towel, by the way. Uh, never want to allow your pen to hover with a bunch of ink on it over your paper. Um, this pen is really easy to control. Uh, it puts down a really thin line. And by the way, most pens will put down an even thinner line in reverse. So if I turn my nib upside down, you can see that it puts down an even extra fine line, which is really good for half tones. <sighs> Got a bunch of ink build up there. Um, so uh, this is, I would say, an extra fine line. Um, it's definitely good for beginners. Um, just a very decent nib. So Hunt Globe 512. Commonly available in stores. Um, all right, so let's clean this off. And let's take a look at the 513 EF. So this is the Hunt Globe 513EF. Notice that this pen is putting down a considerably wider line. So this might be an extra fine. This starts going into fine territories. Um, this pen is also very, very smooth. Puts down a nice line with no pressure and is a lot more flexible, opens up a lot more than the 512. So you can put down a little bit more line variation with it. Um, this pen also writes well in reverse. Let's take a look. Um, yeah, not bad. So it's still perhaps a little bit scratchier in reverse than the 512, but uh, goes from fine to, I would say, extra fine. So this goes from extra fine to extra, extra fine. This goes from fine to extra fine. Um, another really good option. Uh, and quite often you can find these two pens in little packets. By the way, when buying these, there are some 512s and 513Fs that are designed for calligraphy. Make sure that the nibs you're buying are specifically designed for drawing. So these are going to be your workhorse nibs. They're cheap, easy to replace. You're going to find them absolutely everywhere. They're good. They're very good, solid nibs. Um, there are some excellent options available now from Japan. So one of my favorite pens, and the one I might be doing most of the demos with, actually is made by Tachikawa. This is their 600EF. Um, the type of work I do requires a very fine line. I really like cross hatching. I like building up many, many layers of hatch in my drawings. And I find that this pen is a little finer than the Hunt Globe and also writes well in reverse, puts down a super, super thin whisper-like line. 
Um, this nib is very, very sensitive. Maybe not quite as flexible as the Hunt Globe 513EF. Um, if you like working small, uh, if you like putting down lots of thin hatches, then I recommend going online and buying this nib. Uh, it is now available in some art supply stores. Uh, look at that line variation. Again, this is the main advantage of the dip pen. You can go from thin to thick. You show me a single marker that does that, you won't be able to find it. Um, so this is the Tachikawa 600EF, one of my favorite pens. Um, I think it's often used in manga. Really good nib, and you know, not terribly expensive, but you do have to wait for it to come if you're going to order it online. Um, this is another nib that is really famous. Uh, it's the Tachikawa Zebra G. And for some reason it's not going into my pen. I do not know why. There it goes. Okay, uh, the Zebra G. Uh, this is another pen that is really commonly used in manga drawing. Um, it puts down a really, really thin line. This is the Zebra, the Zebra G. Uh, very, very thin. Extra, extra fine line. Uh, I don't know how well it does in reverse writing. It doesn't need reverse writing. Uh, looks like it puts down a slightly thinner line in reverse. Um, this pen is for slightly more advanced users. Uh, it's more flexible. So I can put down a really thick, juicy line if I need to. Um, like that. Um, I would say, you know, look, start off with your Hunt Globe 512, Hunt Globe 513F, and then if you want to invest in other nibs, buy these two. The Zebra G, again, is a little more difficult to use, but look, you get used to it, and the more you do pen and ink, the easier it becomes. Okay, uh, let me show you one additional sort of a specialty nib. Um, this is, you know, for slightly more advanced users. Um, this is a calligraphy nib. This is the Browse Rose. Uh, this is one of the more expensive nibs. Uh, more expensive meaning it's probably two or three dollars, whereas the rest of these nibs you can buy for a dollar. Um, so this is the Browse Rose. So first of all, we're no longer dealing with a fine line. This is not even a medium. This is like a, a broad. Uh, the main advantage of this pen is that it is a calligraphy nib. It's very sensitive. Uh, if you look at it, it has these little cutouts. So basically there's one little part that flexes, which makes this pen really, really flexible. Uh, it's not so delicate that you can't do normal drawing with it. So this is like, like maybe a medium line like this. Uh, let's try in reverse. Uh, not much for reverse writing. It's pretty, uh, pretty scratchy. Uh, not recommended for reverse writing. But here's the main advantage of this nib, this. The fact that I can go from thin to, whoa, this is a really fat, juicy line. Uh, now, this is an ink hog. So this is a pen that I constantly have to keep re-inking every couple of strokes, probably. Um, there are hacks. Uh, there are things that people do, little attachments, uh, that allow the nib to hold more ink. Um, well, we can talk about that later. Uh, most of you won't probably not get to the Browse Rose uh, this semester, but look, it's a good nib to get to know. Look, there are, I'm not going to say hundreds, dozens of different nibs on the market. Uh, pff, just in my collection alone, I probably have 12 different kinds of nibs. Uh, but here are the five main nibs you should be familiar with. Definitely get the first two. And then, if you want, if you're curious, if you want to explore, the world of dim nibs. Uh, get the Tachikawa 600EF, Zebra G, and then if you want a really juicy expressive line, almost like brush-like in quality, get the Browse Rose. Now let's talk about a few different exercises you can do to get yourself acclimated to this medium. The first one is really, really easy. Open up your ink, Prepare your pen by brushing it with a little bit of soap and water or toothpaste. Rinse it out really well. And then dip your pen in the ink, shake it out, and doodle with it. 
So try putting down a bunch of lines. Just see how it feels on the paper. You can do some figure eights like this. Then try flexing the pen. So going from a thin line to a thick line. You can try some figure, figure eights with a little bit of flex in them. So like this. This will give you a sense of how much, <clears throat> how long you can draw before needing to dip the pen. Again, at the beginning, the pen is a little bit slick, it's a little bit stiff, so you might not get as much line from each dip as you would later on. Um, but again, it's not really a big issue. I think once you start drawing, this kind of dipping process becomes kind of automatic. Dip, shake, draw, dip, shake, draw. You don't even think about it anymore, really. Okay, so that's exercise number one. Just do a bunch of doodles. Uh, use either the 512 or the 513EF. Again, just get acclimated to putting down lines. You can do this while talking on the phone, draw little faces, and just get the hang of using the pen, holding it correctly. By the way, uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but you want to make sure you hold it with the curve side up. So that's normal writing. Curve side down, that's reverse writing. Um, look, try reverse writing too. Right, see what that feels like. It's going to be a little bit scratchier, I think, usually, uh, depending on the paper, <clears throat> the normal writing. But again, just you know, do a bunch of doodles. Play with a pen. If you've never used it before, it's definitely a different experience. You feel like you're in the 18th century. <clears throat> okay, so that is the first exercise. Look, fill a page with it, fill two pages, doesn't really matter. Just doodle with a pen. Doodle with the pen. Next exercise is going to get you acclimated to the two main categories, two main ways of applying hatch, applying value to your drawing. So that's going to be exercise number two, hatching. Now we're also going to be using ink and watercolor washes to apply value. Um, there's a lot of advantages to doing it that way. Um, but uh, our first illustration is going to be only using the, the pen to create value, and for that you need to learn how to hatch. So let's practice the two different two different kinds of hatching we're going to use in this class to apply value. The first one is pretty easy. It works like this. You're going to, let me zoom out a little bit so you can see. Okay, so I'm going to plant my elbow on the table or on the drawing board if it's big enough, and then use the elbow as a fulcrum to move my arm back and forth. Usually hatching works from the top down, so from here this way. A couple of things. Um, you want to make sure that your hatching has even spaces in between. So that's something I want all of you to practice. Move your hand Move your arm really slowly. Uh, I'm also sometimes resting my hand on my pinky, so I'm allowing my pinky nail to glide along the paper. Uh, that helps me control the pressure. This is what I call elbow hatching. Um, elbow hatching has the advantage of being really straight and allowing me to apply really large areas of hatch. So I'm using my entire fulcrum in the elbow. So you can see that if I want, let's see how long the hatch. I can apply really long, really even areas of hatching. So this is good for starting the illustration, for filling large areas. Um, if I want to apply a slightly darker value, I will simply shift my angle a little bit and apply another layer. So this is like the equivalent of wash when it comes to hatching. So once again, uh, the advantage of elbow hatching is that it is usually very even with practice, of course. Uh, it's easy to get the spacing even. It's easy to cover large areas. The problem is it's hard to change angles. Um, so in order to change angles, usually what I'll do is I'll rotate the paper. I can move my elbow a little bit. That's going to give me a different direction.
or I can move the paper to give me a direction. It's hard to very quickly change directions when you're elbow hatching. That's number one. Number two, uh, sometimes you want your hatching to be straight, but sometimes you want it to curve around the form you're trying to draw. Elbow hatching is not particularly good for it. Uh, so I might be able to pull off a little bit of curvature with an elbow hatch. Let's see if I can do it here. A little bit, right? Uh, but mostly it tends to run straight. So uh, this is called elbow hatching. This is my term. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's called something else in the industry. Um, elbow hatching. So I'm planting my elbow on the on the table and using my elbow as a fulcrum. There's another kind of hatching, uh, which is called wrist hatching. So wrist hatching, the fulcrum is the wrist. You can also employ the fingers. I guess that's more like finger hatching. But wrist hatching works like this. I'm using the rotation of my wrist and putting down a stroke this way. This one takes a little bit more practice to make it even. The strokes, because you're using the wrist, tend to be a little bit shorter, so it's hard to get longer strokes when using the wrist. But you have a little bit more fine motor control. So wrist hatching is better for detail, for finishing the drawing. So quite often, I'll start off with a layer of elbow hatching. And then, as I work my way to the finish, I'll transition to wrist hatching. Um, the other advantage of hatching from the wrist is that your wrist naturally has a curvature to it. So it's easier to get curved lines. Look, uh, this is ultimately a stylistic choice. Uh, there are styles of hatching where the hatching really closely follows forms. And if, the, if those forms are organic, then they're going to curve a lot. So if you look at a lot of like Renaissance pen and ink work, uh, Albert Durer, uh, you'll see that he almost never hatches with a straight line. He's almost always curving around the forms, doing um, cross contour, which is a modern term, but uh, really reinforcing the forms that he's seeing. Um, OK, so that is wrist hatching. The advantage is that you have little, you know, much more fine motor control. And look, you use your fingers too. So for a little tiny hatching, I guess this is finger hatching. Uh, but these are two broad categories. So this is B. This is your wrist hatching. And this is your next exercise. Fill half the paper, or fill the entire paper, with different kinds of hatch. Again, get used to it, get acclimated, get comfortable, see how much hatch you can put down before you have to re-dip the pen. Get familiarized. Um, once you're comfortable with these two different hatching methods, then we're going to do a third exercise, which is a little more difficult. It might require practice, might require you having to do it a few different times. We're going to create a value scale using our hatch. In this next exercise, I'm going to do a value scale. This part's going to be white, and over here I'm going to gradually go darker and darker and darker with a series of multi-directional hatching until we get pretty dark, perhaps almost black. Let's give this a shot. We're mostly going to be using our elbow hatching method for this. Uh, it's the one that's used for covering large amounts of territory. <clears throat> So here we're going to separate pure white and a really light gray. So for this, I'm going to use reverse writing to put down a really fine layer of hatch. Again, plant your elbow on the board or the table. You can change the angle a little bit if you want. I'm going to be changing my angle quite a lot in this drawing. And let's apply one layer of hatch. By the way, um, this elongated rectangle is 2 inches wide by 8 inches across. Dimension is not terribly important, but look, let's just say for this assignment, let's stay with these dimensions. I also do not need to stay within the lines. Uh, that can be taped off or cleaned up afterwards. Uh, don't worry about that. Uh, try more or less to stay within the borders. Uh, you want to get some kind of elongated rectangle value scale, but uh, not particularly important. 
All right, so let's put down one layer of hatch. Sometimes I do a little practice run before I put down a hatch. Uh, notice also that I'm holding my pen way back. That increases the length of the stroke and also gives me a little bit of a lighter touch. And the main trick here is to keep the strokes the same width. Uh, are they going to be always perfectly even? No, they're not. But try. So in order to cover large territory, obviously, you're going to have to patch different areas of hatching together. It might feel a little bit uneven at first, but I guarantee you, once you have multiple layers down, it's going to look more even. So don't worry about just filling in certain areas here and there. Um, it's not going to bother anybody. Your drawing is going to look perfectly fine. Now, I'm going to fill in the entire area with one angle of hatch. Here it needs to be really light. Here it's going to go darker. I'm going to switch over to regular writing here and fill the rest of this rectangle with the same angle of hatching. Does it have to be exactly the same angle? No, it doesn't. But try to more or less stay with the same angle. Again, don't worry if there's little separations here between the little areas of hatch. These are things that we're going to go over multiple times. We're not going to be able to see it. It's not going to be as noticeable. Let's put it that way. Speed up a little bit here. Again, I'm doing my best to keep the strokes more or less the same distance apart, but if I occasionally fail, no big deal. <clears throat> By the way, uh, usually there's kind of an optimal angle at which you're going to create the strokes. It's easier to rotate the paper than to rotate your elbow. So quite often, instead of changing the angle of the stroke, I'm just going to keep rotating the angle of the paper. Just an easier way of applying value. One thing to say about this elbow stroke is that it's easier to apply the strokes at an angle running from the upper right to the lower left this way. Um, this is a stroke that's difficult to do the other direction. You really can't do it. Um, <clears throat> so if I want to get a stroke going the other way, I'm just going to rotate my paper until it lines up that way. Up, change the angle a little bit. Again, not terribly important. And particularly here, in this area, we're going to have lots and lots of layers of hatching. You're not going to be able to see individual strokes here. OK, so here, in fact, I should have done this probably starting this way. Uh, I'm going to start increasing the pressure of my stroke to get a slightly heavier line. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a value transition already from lighter to darker. Uh, so this can be pure white, then it transitions to a light gray right about here. So this is maybe one fifth of the way in. Let's apply another layer of hatch. So I'm going to change my angle slightly. Uh, let's do a horizontal stroke in this case. So again, by holding the pen way back, it allows me to get a longer stroke. And also, this is something that I didn't do the first time that I probably should have. Put down a little more pressure in the pen and make your line a little bit thicker. A little bit heavier. But do not make your strokes denser in terms of distance between the strokes, right? Uh, try to keep a consistent width. Um, the reason for this is because so long as the width between the hatching is consistent, the eye is tricked into thinking that these layers, these washes, quote unquote, of hatches are value. Once you start playing with the distances, 
then some of your thicker lines might create the impression of some kind of chicken scratches. Okay, so let's apply another layer. So now we're going to work right about here. Change the angle again. Let's go this way. And let's apply another layer going like this. Now one of the tricks to even this is to make sure that you're going over these little separations between the hatching. That's going to break up the impression that there is a separation in layers and connect your hatches together. Now again, as you're working towards the darks, increase the pressure of your stroke. Go a little bit darker. This exercise is going to help you build even hatching. It's going to help you practice your hatching. Um, it's also going to develop control. So this is a really useful exercise, though it's not particularly interesting. OK, so where were we? Here's first layer, second layer, third layer, uh, one, two, three. OK, so now we're going to work a little bit towards the middle. Let's try a vertical stroke going this way, like this, starting right about here. By the way, uh, when you dip your pen, try to dip all the way up to the reservoir, maybe a little bit more. Um, if you under dip, then you're just going to constantly be dipping. And again, your pen will, at the beginning, hold a little bit less ink, be a little bit stiffer, maybe work even a little bit lighter than this one. Um, that's okay. It'll open up. Again, every pen has its own characteristics depending on how long you've used it. Okay, so you can see that we're building a value scale going this way. Okay, so we started here. Let's go another direction. So we went this way. Let's go at a little bit more of an angle this way and go here. So we're at the halfway point. I'm really starting to press down quite a lot. So not only is the value being built up by layers of hatch, but also with the line quality. OK, uh, let's do one more direction. Let's start going a little more this way. So for this, we're going to flip our paper and right about here put in our last layer of attack. How many layers you put down really isn't terribly important. At a certain point, the hatching becomes a little bit messy. I would say maybe anything after six layers. Okay. And to go all the way dark, what I'm going to do here is apply a hatch of really any direction. Um, the direction here is not terribly important. Really, value starts taking over. When things get built up like this, uh, make sure that you allow the ink to dry in between layers because wet paper tears very easily. And these papers, these pens are somewhat pointy. 
on wet paper there's a risk of there's a risk of tearing okay so there is your somewhat rough uh, there's a few places where um, it's a little bit uneven but um, there's your value scale uh, pre please practice that uh, it's really really important look in most cases uh, for these kind of really even values we're not going to be using hatching we're going to be using ink wash or watercolor wash that's really what it's for for covering large areas for really subtle distinctions between white and light gray um, but this is a really important aspect in just training your hand to apply layers of hatch uh, create even hatching so please do this exercise for me it will have lots of dividends as you begin to do illustrations